Hey everyone, thanks for joining us on Analytic Stories today. Um, real happy to have my friend, client, colleague, Bill Dwyer with me. Bill, thanks for, so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I look forward to this little chat. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about Bill. Uh, he works for a custom a uh, company called Custom Tech Software, and they develop software for the K through 12 space. So you can imagine what Bill's been dealing with over the last year, given what's happened in the school system. And he's worked with Tableau Software for over 10 years. So he is a real veteran of uh, that software for sure. And in particular, he's, he's done a lot of work with the API. So I think we'll get into that. And he's used that to embed his product uh, into something called Infinite Campus. And that actually helps uh, integrate data analytics into the what they call the daily workflow of educators. And Bill started his career actually in computational fluid dynamics. I'd had to read that one in the defense <laughs> industry. So he's, you know, he's definitely changed a course uh, from, from where he started, like many of us has. And he was involved with visualizing the results of uh, 3D, 3D models. And I think that's led to you know, where he is today working in, in the visualization field. So he has had an early start uh, in the space well before many of us. So again, Bill, anything you want to add? No, you, you did a pretty, pretty good job of it. Yeah, I, I just realized when you had asked me to kind of put together a little bio, I'm like, I guess indirectly, I've been doing this stuff since I really entered the professional workforce, and that was in the early 90s. Um, like I said, the CF, the computational fluid dynamics, it's called CFD, right? And uh, we would have these complex 3D models, and you have these flow fields that you need to visualize. And so we were mapping them with colors. And uh, that was mid 90s, early to mid 90s when I was doing that, working on the silicon graphics machines where there wasn't mm. really packages like software, like mature software. Now we worked a lot with uh, NASA Ames developers who oh, were wow. working on the cutting edge there. It was kind of cool. We ended up, there was a magazine called Computer Graphics World back at the time huh. when computer graphics were getting cool with 3D rendering and stuff. And they, they featured a lot of the stuff that I was working on there Neat. because I just immediately took to, let's make this pretty so that people can understand it. Yeah, it, it, uh, I was going to say when you said the Silicon Graphics machines, I was thinking, you know, you could never, you, you didn't have the kind of horsepower that we have in a, in a little laptop today. You must have had some pretty serious hardware to, to make that happen. So, But they were the best machines at the time. I mean, compared to what we're accustomed to now, yeah. <laughs> but back in the day, they were the thing. Yeah, I remember. I, I never worked on one, but I, I, I know those were the, you know, involved with making movies and everything, anything they had to do with crunching numbers and making graphics that was that was what you you right. had that's on what, hand and, that's and they weren't that's what they weren't cheap industrial light and magic right yeah yeah well cool so i'm sure uh, hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that as we, we get into this so let's let's jump in sure. and i i mentioned you know that you're you're working with schools and they're starting to thank goodness deal with kids coming back into the classroom and it's probably going to be similar to how corporations, I would think, have to start thinking about getting people back into their offices. And I see you're, you know, you're in your office. So are you, how are you seeing schools use data and analytics, which is what you're bringing them, for their planning? And do you see any parallels potentially with how companies could apply those same ideas? Um, in, in some ways, there are uh, areas where it does make sense to do comparison and others where it doesn't. And I'll explain why. So one of the other things that uh, I hadn't included in my bio for you, Lee, is that I'm a, also a sitting member of my local board of education, right? And I've mm. been on my board of ed for 11 years. Uh, when decisions are made in school districts, they aren't always made for the most logical of reasons because you have pressures from local municipal authorities, state dictating guidelines, but at the mm. same time, you have local community constituencies leaning on you to try to get what they want. Sure. So um, as far as the data goes, so we're working with school districts across the country, and it's been really treated different regionally. You know, some areas have 
totally shut down. It tends to be your larger urban school districts have been virtual all year. Um, your mm -hmm. suburban districts have either been a hybrid learning model where the kids are in a couple of days and home virtual a couple of days to kids are there all the time. And so depending upon um, where you are in the process, they've been using their data and the associated analytics. Attendance has been a huge thing this year because you're taking it all different ways. Um, oh, yeah. And how, how do you qualify a student who is completely virtual to have been in attendance, right? It gets a little bit gray in that area. Uh, and then the other thing that they're looking at is for those that were in hybrid learning environments, um, how do things compare when a student is there physically versus when a student is at home learning? And so that in preparation for next year, a lot of that type of analysis is starting to get underway now. Um, but okay, I, start, I started the answer with, it depends because no matter what the data says, sometimes the decisions are just made kind of unilaterally based upon guidelines that the local school doesn't have control right. of. Regardless of what the data might indicate <laughs> exactly. or, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting about the idea of, you know, where, where you know, ge the geography of it coming into play, of course, but then also the idea of, you know, measuring things. So if you think about you know, measuring, okay, they were home or they were in person or hybrid and I wonder how that plays into the, the real world that, that as people look to, you know, sh should we continue to let people work from home. Uh, how is it really played out? Did it, is it, is it better for productivity for people, whether that's what we expect them to output or it keeps them happier and healthier uh, because they, they just prefer to work from home now and, and how companies are going to, to figure all that out, you know, is going to be pretty interesting. Oh, I fully agree. And in, in our company, you know, I work at a private company. And as you can see, I am in the office because personally, I find I am more productive when I come to the office. So I've been in the office uh, six, eight, eight months, right? Uh, but there's not a lot of other people here. And uh, so it's it's going to, we're, we're all going to have to kind of toe a fine line between being respectful of people's, people's you know, personal health situations and trying to get back to the productivity and the work mm -hmm. environment that we saw prior to everything shutting down. And I think it, it, there's no one right way to do it. Every company has its own culture. Um, I know that for some of our employees, it has been a good thing. I think it has made them more productive to not have to come in and out of the office. But for others, it's, I think it's been the opposite. And so as a company, you kind of have to weigh all of that stuff as you look at how you're going to realign yourself when things are uh, yeah. put here for normal. I, don't know you, normal. It was, I was thinking as you, as you were describing that you work with schools all over the country, that you could use that data almost to you know, publish some kind of report if you were allowed to you know, by keeping things anonymous that would be, you know, th that somebody could use in some way, even for business planning, it'd be, you know, that you could say, yeah, schools in these kinds of areas are going to stay hybrid. So you better plan for your workforce to stay flexible. Don't, don't expect to drag everybody back in to, to the workforce, especially because you're seeing them plan now. And, and you kind of have a forward look and, and a lot of businesses are gonna be impacted by what the schools do because they have to deal with their kids. And I will tell you that's actually going on now, actually in advance of it. So I work um, with a, a company called Infinite Campus. They're a student information system. They're one of the largest in the country and they have districts all over the country. And many of them, I would say now most of them are hosted in their data centers. So they have the ability now to look at this school year's collection of data in aggregate yeah. and regionally, like you just described, to look at, you know, what does attendance really look like this year compared to last year? 
uh, what does uh, academic performance look like in these different regions, whether they're virtual or whether they're in person. And they are actually actively working and pulling that data, and they're actually sharing it with uh, the United States Department of Education, because I've actually oh. been privy to some of that information. So that's the kind of thing that you do in advance of making some of these, what end up being unilateral decisions, telling people you must do this, do that. So that is actually going on. Yeah. And we see it more on a local level with districts, you know, for those that have ladder, some, some ability to make their own local decision, um, doing the same kind of thing, but keeping it more to their own local data set that they have been um, compiling all of this school year. Yeah. The good thing I can tell you is that one of the things, you know, when talking about the overall health and welfare and safety of the students, mm -hmm. uh, again, being involved in my school, all the schools I work with, I am not aware of any instance where a, a student or staff member has been pos COVID positive and ended up being like a spreader. The school mm. environments have been set up in such a well kind of coordinated way where people are distanced um, that all of the stories that you hear about a lot of sick kids coming to school, they got sick socially outside of the school environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that is encouraging for us looking at public education. If we kind of continue what we've done and follow the guidelines that we have, uh, we can do a good job of managing any instances that come up. Getting yeah, and getting the, the kids back in. And so yep. I'm just curious, just to kind of wrap up this part, is there any particular metric that people are using in the school system that is interesting to you that you could see as some kind of measure that we could adapt into the, the, the business, a business framework? Well, it, it, I don't know that it correlates directly, but there is a lot of work being done by districts. Uh, we've got cohorts of students that are 100% virtual. They just said, you know, I'm not coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have those that have been coming in. And um, now that we've got enough data, they're beginning to try to do correlations and what's the academic performance for those students that are 100% virtual compared to those that have been going in and getting face time with their teachers and other students. Um, I think that will be helpful in education. I don't know though, Lee, how that really translates to private business. I think mm -hmm. it ends up being more anecdotal on how well someone performed in their job yeah. when they were home. Yeah. It's probably a whole new field that like folks in HR have to deal with now though, because now they're they're gonna have to jump in to an area where it's 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 a it's like you said, it's unknown. And if it's anecdotal, but yet they're making pretty big decisions about the future yeah. of the company, right? Where your workforce is, you know. Uh, Op operating kinds of things. Do we have buildings? And, and you know, it, it's it's really fundamental now what what they decide in the next six to twelve months about how a company is going to be structured and employees and things. So, from that yeah. perspective, I think it it's it's pretty interesting to think about for for what businesses are going to have to tackle and and the people that are going to be responsible that may not have been exposed so much to analytics. Yes, absolutely. In their decision-making process. So yeah, pretty. it's pretty cool stuff. So speaking of new and, and maybe being uncomfortable, uh, I was thinking about your the, the work that you do and that a lot of it is built on using these APIs that Tableau has. In, in its software to kind of create the hooks between your product and, and the infinite campus product. And I was wondering, I'm thinking like, you know, how much is, does that put like the fate of custom tech in a way, or that, you, you know, your product in Tableau's hands, right? If they're make decisions and that affects what you do. So has there been a time, and I think this is important for people that work in, with APIs in general, like you hear things like, Google or Facebook or someone changes their API and all of a sudden everybody's scrambling, right? So it's not local to you, but has there been a time when, uh, you know, you've been in a situation where the, they changed how the API worked? Uh, 
and it went in kind of a different direction maybe than you were thinking it was going to go or where you wanted it to go. And how did that work out? Yeah, so I got to say, um, I have to give Tableau credit for doing a pretty good job of kind of announcing beforehand where they're going mm. with their products and their API development. And also, well, when we had you know TC in person, making mm. those people working, the developers working in that part of the product, highly accessible. So I've had a lot of interactions with those folks to help. At the, co at the Tableau conference, that's what you yeah. mean by and TC. Then, okay. Yeah, meeting them in person, saying, here's what I'm doing, and then their willingness to follow up you know, by emails afterwards. Um, and so I've always been able, and, and I'm in a somewhat of a unique environment in that um, we don't, our company doesn't write and maintain Infinite Campus. And obviously we don't write and maintain Tableau, but I'm marrying the two. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of dancing between a couple of big elephants that are um, developing their own product, both of which I don't have control over. And things like um, authentication and message passing between the two may change from either side. Um, I got to tell mm -hmm. you, when you're developing like I am, you're never totally done, right? You're just always, the product <laughs> is always evolving. Sure. And so... And I've always uh, have two or three versions of something in the hopper now. I think it's just evolutionary protection against what you described, where you think something is going to be one way and then it takes longer for them to develop or something like that. And so I try to make sure that we're in a place where something like that doesn't become a showstopper, where it breaks your product. For example, right. that would be the. One of the I'm, I'm, I'm working when when Tableau started releasing more and more um, browser based um, dashboard development capabilities. Right. Mm -hmm. They've yeah. already now made public announcements. That they're shooting to get parity in the browser environment compared to the desktop. environment. Right. But they're still lagging in the data connection arena. And one mm -hmm. of the things that I'm just I, I have a development project that I have like three quarters done, but is absolutely on hold because I need them to release a web-based version of the web data connectors because it's oh, you know, intended to okay. rely on. Spoke with the developers at DC, yeah, that's absolutely on the roadmap. So, you know, in that regard, I generally try not to put all my eggs into one basket because if you do, then if something changes, yeah, you find yourself in a bad place. More often than not, what I find is, uh, again, in the evolutionary development style, I will build something with the current APIs and then other um, APIs or other ways of doing it may become available. And then I'll look at rotating from mm -hmm. what I originally built to the new approach. Um, I can give an example where one of the things that we do is uh, one of our processes the <clears throat> Infinite Campus software actually goes out and asks for a full catalog of everything that's on the Tableau server, right? Oh, right. Yeah, I remember Bring that. it back so I can give drop-down menus to navigate your Tableau content in another project. The Tableau REST API was built for and does that kind of thing pretty well, but not fast. And so oh. if you've got a large catalog of content as an end user, oh sitting there two or three minutes waiting for the rest API to continue to finish do its thing. Yeah. All it. So then I started with, well, you know what? Tableau does make their Postgres database readable in a read-only manner. Just learn how to query that. I could probably get one system to just open it, run the query on that database, which we know is fast, come back. So I start playing with that mm. because the pain of watching this thing load every time was just too much. And sure enough, you know, over time, we were able to get it all together to work. And now we were able to basically modify the product. So instead of retrieving the catalog using the REST API calls, we do a direct Postgres query and it comes back in about five seconds. As opposed it's a little to better than three minutes. Three or four, exactly correct. So that is kind of when I, I tell that story kind of as a way to you know, talk about how we're kind of always doing things on multiple paths because you never know which one is going to end up being the best one. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting that you you've got that because I think in the in in the world where people are say you know authoring dashboards 
there's it, it doesn't seem like they have most people have the the time or the resources to to even develop something in that way you know more forward thinking and ex experimental uh, almost if you want to say that they're just kind of like, i got to get this thing out the door and which you know it would be good if if there was if people had more flexibility to to do that uh, kind kind of thing you know i'm just thinking out loud from a yeah oh no you know, and I guess there's also two perspectives. Because we're creating a product that we have to support, the last thing I want to do is put a product out that breaks a lot or is hard to support because mm -hmm. it ends up being a drain on the business. So you really need something um, that is solid, stable, and easy to use because it keeps your support costs down. You know, we, I have right. a support desk with a dedicated support person. So if you're having a problem, you call us, you send us an email, you enter a support ticket, and we get right to it. We don't want to be drowning in those. So your, your product really does need to be solid and stable and, and performant. Yeah. So let me ask you, it may actually just it brought a thought up. And you were telling me about this when we were just having a chat before we, we started recording and you were talking about documentation. And I'm wondering if you could give our listeners any ideas about documentation, because I know that one thing most people are guilty of when they're doing work in Tableau and probably other, other situations is they're so busy doing it, they're not documenting what they're doing. They're not, they're not really writing down why their calculations are a certain way or why they made certain decisions in, in, in certain things or you know, capturing a description of what, what a calculation is even for, or, or, you know, the parameters they're building, whatever it is, they're just doing stuff. And then even for that person, sometimes they go back and say, I don't really remember what I, what I yeah. did. Uh, and certainly if there's a handoff and someone else has to take it over now, it's almost that they have to dissect it and, and, and backtrace to figure out what somebody did sometimes. Absolutely. So any suggestions on how people can, can get better at that? Well, you don't in that arena, and I'll tell you, I am as guilty of it as anyone else. When no, start, don't say that. No, no, no I'll tell you. It's um, when you start in a product where you're doing it all yourself, you don't need to document it because you've got it all here. Mm. Uh, the problem is then when you bring in other people and you try to hand it off, yeah. you find out how much time you end up not wasting, but spending trying to transfer all that knowledge. Then the, the mm -hmm. understanding and the role and the importance of documentation really hits home. And so what I do now is we have process documents for our product that we do, as well as logic in the dashboards that we are building, where we have a process document on how you're going to go about building the, the quantities that you're needing to get to your, your end analysis results. And then I am a huge proponent of um, incalculated fields, you know, you can comment them in Tableau. Comment your calculated fields like you're commenting, writing a full piece of code in another mm -hmm. language, um, because that way, when someone else goes in, um, even if the cal even if it's just a description, you know, you may name your field like I'm a big. If I'm making a field that's a filter, it's going to be called "Show me whatever" because that is mm -hmm. my terminology for this is a filter. That's good. That's but a it, good idea. But at the top of that calculated field, I'll put comments on exactly what the field is intended to be used for and the logic that's embedded. Um, that helps a lot then when someone else goes in uh, to pick up your, your work and, uh, and run with it to make them much more productive quickly. Yeah. yeah and so then, you have so, some discipline to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And at first you feel like it's making you take longer to build the product. But in reality, it's helping you think more clearly and it's saving you a ton of road, ton of time. Out of it. I like that last point is important because like you said, I think people rush through it. Either one, they don't even know they can comment. I think that's probably part of it that they, they might not even be aware that, that that's a thing you can do yep. or should do, right? Uh, and, and then if you, you start that, I think it does. It's always the key is, you know, how well can you explain it? is a reflection of how well you understand what you're doing too. 
So if you're commenting it and you're like, I don't really know how to describe this, maybe there's something about it that you need to reconsider. That's that's and that's exactly why I said it helps you think more clearly because it it does do that. And if just like I said, if you can't describe it to yourself, it means you probably don't really understand what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's an important lesson for all of us. So I think that's yeah. a, something I want to talk about more with people. So let's. Uh, I got one more question I want to ask you about. Now, you, you of course you know we have to talk about beer a little bit. So Bill and I are we're beer nerds. Uh, we're kind of nerds in general, but we also happen to be beer nerds. And we've been fortunate enough that we've shared a few good beers over the years. And I'm looking forward to when you and I can sit down and, you know, have a beer together and have a toast. Oh, yeah. And and I'm sure that one thing that you're going to toast about is what you want to see happen in the world of analytics. Yeah. <laughs> so what will you be raising your glass to? Uh, I am going to be raising my glass, and this is an optimistic glass that I'm raising to you, Lee, uh, is that the analytics companies, Tableau in particular, I'm encouraged about, is taking big complex data sets and making the manipulation and management of those easier, okay? Because the, pro the software product itself is very good at building effective dashboards for interacting with your data and allowing to go from high level down to drill downs, whatever you want. The real challenge is starting with a very, very complex data set and getting it into a shape or a mode where it's easily analyzed to get out specific data elements. I think okay. Tableau's new data model goes a long way towards that. Um, we all have to kind of relearn though how we've built our dashboards. I know I'm I'm struggling with it a little bit because I'm an old SQL dog, right? And everything mm, is a join. Mm -hmm. And now when I have these squishier relationships where the joins aren't created until Tableau interprets how I'm using it in the dashboard or on the sheet, I have to relearn some things. But as I come around, I'm like, you know, this is actually much more flexible and powerful. And it does go a long way towards making it easy to take multiple data elements and bring them together in an easily analyzed um, data set. So can you give me an example? You, you said that you want the software to be able to handle these larger data sets. What's this, what's a situation where they're not doing the, jo the job the way you, you want it to be done? Well, so the database that we work in, okay, for the SIS um, has 2,500 tables. Okay, it's a highly normalized SQL database. And so to get the data elements that you want in your analysis, you may need multiple tables. And if you okay. have a good, if you have a good solid SQL background and understanding, that make that's not so hard. But it also becomes a limiting factor in who you can open up really effective analytics to. The new data model is going to make it easier to bring more people in to the realm of being effective data analysts. And in our environment, you know, basically it's the K-12 education environment, we don't have a ton of really good data nerds. And so we yeah. need to be able to take other data efficient people and be able to bring them in on these models. Uh, the other thing I think that is I'm, I'm really encouraged about, um, I've started using Prep Builder more and more. Because oh, okay. we have a lot of repeatable data processes where if you take the time to build a prep flow, you can take a data file coming from a third party assessment company and transform it into a nice uh, extract that provides for easy analysis. And then every time you get that file from that same thing, you can just run that flow. And so that combined with you know the data management piece now of server, uh, I think Tableau moving to the data, you know, ETL world, extract, transform, load world, actually is going to be a boon to um, many industries, especially again ones where we're a little bit um, short on technical talent in our end client. But if we can mm -hmm. provide nice tools that we can just now put on their system and say, run that, and your data is ready to go, right. it's a big help. So that's what I want to toast to: is making complex data. More easily analyzed by non-data nerds. 
I, I like that. And I think that's a, that's an, a, a, an ongoing challenge, of course, right? I mean, it, it's always like the more data there is, then that job continues to have its challenges. And then there's the, ultimately there's, as we started the discussion, the decision-making you do with it, right? So it's not just the, how do I get it? How do I make it accessible? How do I bring it down to people? In a, in a in a technical way, it's then how do they start to use that? And you're, you know, I, and I think it's not a, a a scenario that's limited to the education world. I think the business world and you know, has the same thing, and it's only been highlighted because of what's gone on the last year with data thrown in front of us every day. Right, you're always seeing some kind of chart, some kind of figure discussed about increases in in flat lines and curves and right i mean <laughs> the world has never been you know shown that much information on such a scale right Every, yeah. everywhere you know down to kids you know see, yeah. seeing that stuff and hearing about it so uh, I, I think it's it's opened up a whole new um kind of a set of activities that you know, we'll, we'll transfer over into every aspect of our, our lives. And, and, and yeah, the making it simple is, is a key, you know, to, to making any use of that data. Yep. So hopefully these tools will help get us there, right? Because yeah. more people we can get effectively looking at data and using it to help them in their processes, the better off we will all be. Yeah, because if you can't do that and they can't get the data into their hands, then ultimately it's not that useful, right? That's right. And yep. can't do anything with it. Yep. So any uh, any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, in my industry, this has been an incredibly interesting year, right? <laughs> as, as is everyone. Um, and uh, I got to say, the, the data analytics has been very important. One of the things I didn't even touch upon is you know, student contact tracing, right? When someone gets sick, one of the oh, things yeah. is contact tracing. We've done an awful lot of this year with dashboards, and that's been oh. a huge benefit. So I see going forward in this, we're going to be entering a new world, an opportunity. You know, I guess um, it breeds, this change breeds opportunity to do things differently and better. And I think, as you mentioned, more people using the data effectively uh, provides that opportunity for us. Yeah. Yeah, everybody talks about digital transformation, you know, but it's all focused on, oh, how to, you know, what's the impact at, at a corporation or some kind of company, but I think it's everywhere, right? Just like you said, there's elements of this that are transforming how schools, not only what they're doing physically in schools to protect people, but, you know, what they learn about students, how they, how they deal with students' behaviors, their learning skills, all those things you, you brought up. Uh, it's a huge, a huge digital transformation for for that space as well. That probably only barely touched on, uh, I think. You know, uh, given that the focus has been transitioning just to get kids on Zoom and pay attention. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's a that's a hard enough challenge technically and and that's personally true. without even dealing with all the the other things that are are there. So yeah. So as always, it's good to see you, my friend. I appreciate your 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 thoughts and and what you shared. I think there's some real nuggets in there that people can can take away. Whether you're a parent thinking about what's going to happen with your kids, or you know thinking about how to apply some of these same principles in in the workplace from someone who's got a, a pretty good view of data and where it's going. So thanks again, and I do truly look forward to to seeing you in person soon. And so we can raise that glass and look forward to bigger, better things, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Lee. Yes. I, appreciate, yeah. I appreciate your contacting me and I've enjoyed this little chat. Absolutely. Stay safe. You Bye, too. everyone. So long.